chapter of the book of Daniel. Third verse. And they that came many to righteousness have the child for other endeavors. Some years ago, I was writing a reference to a past in Connecticut. That past man in Eastern Church. I came upon a venerable oak tree. The bread was nailed to the tree with this sentence rather rudely leveled upon it. God this field. One feet under this tree. That great creature has many statues and memorials and cenotaphs in different parts of the world. But it seems to me that that board with that sign nailed to that oak tree over a hundred and seventy years since he died was the most striking and eloquent tribute of all under this tree, George Whitfield Street. About the year 1729, the three and I had gone into the Bell Inn in Gloucester, England. We would have seen there a lad about 15 years of age, clad in a blue apron with a sliced uh, cast in one of his eyes, drawing ale for his mother's customers. Within nine years, that boy will be the most popular preacher in the world. His name a household word wherever the English language is spoken. And wherever it is announced that he will preach, thousands upon thousands gather. A singular providence turned him in the right path. His older brother took charge of that bell in, and the young Whitfield uh, had a falling out with his brother's wife, and left the inn, and went back to school. He counted that a gracious providence, that falling out with his brother's wife, because that why God took him out of that inn as he says, from drawing wine for drunkards to drawing water out of the wells of salvation for sinners. At 18 years of age, his mother secured a post for him as servitor at Hamburg College at Oxford. There he fell in with Charles Wesley first, and then John, and joined that remarkable group of students there, who were dubbed by the undergraduate Methodists because of their methodical habits of prayer and meditation and visitation of the poor. He says that at first he was a little ashamed to be seen in their company because they were looked down upon in the university. And he went to their meetings by night, like Nicodemus. But afterwards, he came out openly with their testimony. At the age of 21, the Bishop of Gloucester told him that because of his singular gift, he would ordain him. He was to preach uh, his ordination sermon, the 
Sunday after the ordination, he sent a sermon to a minister in the country trying to prove to him that he was unworthy of the high office. The minister sent the sermon back to him in two parts with a guinea enclosed, saying that he had preached one half of the sermon in the morning and the other in the evening. When the young Whitfield arose in St. Mary's Church there, wrong with a great multitude, a prediction of what was to come, he says that at first he was somewhat overawed and overcome by the sight of so many of his neighbors and friends who knew him as a child. But as the fire began to burn, he soon saw that the great number of them were much moved, although some more. The next week, a man came to the bishop and complained that Whitfield's sermon had driven 15 people mad. Well, he said, I hope the madness will last at least until next Sunday. When he was through at Oxford, he preached in the Tower of London to the soldiers and to the prisoners and visited the sick. And already the throng began to gather wherever it was announced that he would preach. John Wesley invited him to come out to Georgia and take his place at Savannah as the chaplain there. And he spent about a year in Georgia. And there he conceived one of his foremost subjects, the establishment of an orphanage for little children, always dear to his heart. When he came back from Georgia, he found that the doors of nearly all the churches of the Church of England were closed against him because of the prejudice against the Methodists. Although he, like Wesley, remained a priest of the Church of England, he therefore resolved that if he couldn't preach in the churches, he would preach in the open air. Remembering Jesus, he said, he had the mountain for his pulpit, the sky for his sounding board, and who, when the Jews rejected him, went out into the highways and the hedges. His first experiment in what then everyone thought of as a shocking thing Although he had seen that where Jesus speak, was down near Bristol at the town of Kingswood, a mining town. Two hundred miners were there who heard him, but the next Sunday ten thousand were there. And as he preached, he could tell the effect his sermon was having on them by the white butters that their tears traced down their cold, divine faces. And after that Sunday, he said, I have found my parish. It is the world, the streets, the hills, the fields are my pulpit. He had one great advantage as a preacher in that time. And that is that the great doctrines of grace were almost unspoken in the churches then. The churches, the ministers, were preaching ethics and morality. And the truth of sin, of judgment, of grace, of regeneration, of redemption of heaven, all that was in eclipse. And when Whitfield preached it, it was indeed glad tidings and new tidings. 
On his second trip to America, he made the acquaintance and friendship of the philosopher Benjamin Franklin, who printed and published his sermons for him. Franklin said that the sermons did him great injustice because they conveyed no idea of his power as a preacher, his wonderful voice, and his manner of delivery. Nevertheless, those printed sermons were read all over the English-speaking world. And just as the spoken words, so the written and read words brought sinners to repentance and into the kingdom of Christ. On perhaps the third visit across the Atlantic, 13 times, and it was an ordeal in that day to cross it once. On the third visit, he made the acquaintance of William Tennant of Philadelphia, or near there, the famous Log College under the Chamonix, that afterwards became Princeton College. And with Jonathan Edwards and those tenants, he was one of the trumpet voices of the Great Awakening, one of the two great revivals that our country has seen, the great revival of the first decade of the 19th century, the Great Awakening of the fourth decade of the 18th century. He collected funds for Princeton College, for Dartmouth, books for the library at Harvard, and a splendid bronze statue at the entrance to the campus of the University of Pennsylvania signifies his part in the establishment of that great institution. His last visit to America was in the year 1769. He was then in his 50s. He got as far as Exeter and preached his last sermon there on the text from 2 Corinthians, Examine yourselves if ye be in a faith. The mark of death was upon him, and when he rose to preach, it was some minutes before he could find out of it. One of the ministers living on a platform said to him, you are more fit for your bed than you are for the pulpit. True, he said, and then looking upward, he gave utterance to that beautiful sentence, Lord Jesus. I am weary in my work, but not weary of it. The next day he got as far as Newbury Court, where he went to bed in the home of the minister of the Presbyterian Church there. At two in the morning he awakened in great distress, but he said to his traveling companion, a few more rides and the good pulpit sweat will bring me round. But the great writer, the great hunter for souls, as he liked to call himself, had taken his last drive. He died that morning and was buried there beneath the pulpit of that church in Newbury Court. A eulogistic Cenotaph is on the wall, and you can find them in London and elsewhere. But his best epitaph was the one which he prepared for himself. Here lies George Whitfield, what manner of person he was, the great day will discover. Now let us take a look at this extraordinary man and preacher about uh, the middle stature, 
and until after he was forty fair and thin. After that, portly, in spite of his incessant horseback riding. He had, as I said, a slight squint in one eye. And the English actor Foot Priest wrote a play caricaturing him, spoke out him as Dr. Clinton. He was immaculate in his dress and presence. All who heard him testify to the magic of his voice. The noted English actor David Garrett said that he would give a hundred guineas if he could say all the way Whitfield pronounced it. And he said that if Whitfield were disguised, he could make any assemblage of people weep by the way, he spoke the word Mesopotamia. His voice is not only a beautiful voice, but a powerful and penetrating voice. Benjamin Franklin, who heard him so frequently, said that he used to be skeptical about the account in the ancient histories of the Athenian and Persian generals addressing such great multitudes of men. But after he heard Whitfield, he saw that 30,000 heard him there. He was less skeptical about those ancient accounts. When he was preaching once in front of what is now Independence Hall in Philadelphia, a man away down on the Delaware River, it must be a mile, heard clearly the wind being favorable, some of the sentences with his face. He was an emotional preacher. Rarely preached a sermon without weeping. But when he was criticized for that by some, he said, Why should I not weep? But you will not weep for yourself, although you are on the verge of destruction. He was a dramatic preacher. One of the bishops said to Bethar, another English actor, why is it that we have so little effect upon our people? He said, I'll tell you why. We actors preach reality, preach fiction as if it were reality. While you preachers preach reality as if it were fiction. But Whitfield never did that. He preached reality as reality. And it could be said of him, those words of the famous couplet of Baxter, I preach as never saw to preach again, and as a dying man to dying men. He had a wonderful power of description. On one occasion, he was preaching in New York and described a ship on a beam band, like that ship we've been reading about this past week in the Atlantic. And as he did so, he cried out, What now? What next? And several sailors in the gallery sprang to their feet and exclaimed, The long boat! Take to the long boat! He was preaching once in the chapel of Lady Huntington, his aristocratic benefactor in England, and in the congregation was the fastidious Lord Chesterfield of the famous or infamous Letters to His Son. Whitfield was liking a sinner to a blind beggar with his dog and staff going along a dangerous cliff. The dog gets away from the beggar, and the beggar with his staff is trying to get his dog again, and comes near to the edge of the cliff, and his staff falls over, and he reaches down to recover it and falls over himself. And just as he did so, 
Chesterfield leaps, deep in his name, my God, he's gone. The town people heard him gladly. The statesmen, the actors, the people of great business in England also came to that wooden tabernacle in London, the first in the long succession of the tabernacles of evangelism. But his chief church, of course, was the open air, recalling the greatest preacher, because in all the history of Christianity, no one ever addressed so many thousands of people. Now we think it's a fine thing if in a city like Pittsburgh or Chicago or New York we get together 10 or 12,000 people to hear one of the evangelists of the day after the meetings have been worked up for a year. But here is this horseback evangelist who travels through the country. A great part of his men partially settled, and yet day after day, in his journal you can read so many thousand expressions, an unheard of thing. And probably he has brought as many sinners to repentance and into the kingdom of Christ as any preacher in the history of the church. I said he was a dramatic preacher. And why shouldn't he be? The great facts of the gospel are dramatic. The soul and its destiny. When he came to a town where the court was in session, sometimes, as the judges did, he would put the black cap on his head and in solemn awful tones would pronounce the judgment of God upon the sinner. And yet the same preacher the next day would walk by the side of a condemned murderer for half a mile to the gallows, pleading with him to come to repentance and salvation. He was preaching once in Camden. It was towards evening and they had lanterns. It was a boy, about five years of age, in the crowd, he was fascinated. And he came right up to the pulpit with his lantern, held it up so that he could see the face of the preacher. And as he did so, he fell in a dead faint. Some years after, his book here was preaching in the Brick Church in New York. And before he went into the pulpit in the vestry, the minister, Dr. Rogers, said to him, I hope you'll preach with the same fervor that you did when that boy at Camden, he held the lantern up in your face, fell in a faint. Which he said, I remember that incident well. I've often wondered what became of that boy. And Dr. Rogers said, I am that boy. He used the power of apostasy. David Hume, another unbeliever like Franklin, liked to hear him preach. Yet he reminded people like that how Herod Antipas liked to hear John the Baptist preach and yet cut his head off. Well, Hume was going with the crowd in Edinburgh at five o'clock in the morning. Cold weather. He had his lantern in his hand. And he met a man who stopped him and said, Where are you going? He said, I'm going to hear Whitfield preach. Why, the man said, I thought you were not a Christian. No, I am not, he answered, but Whitfield is. Or rather, he put it this way, I thought you did not believe in Christianity. No, he said, 
but Whitfield died. An earnest preacher. Now, what was his message? The two great parts of his preaching were, first of all, justification by faith, and second, the new birth. Justification by faith was the doctrine which brought about the Reformation. And yet already, in the middle of that 18th century, the doctrine was in eclipse. Whitfield, with trumpet voice, proclaimed justification by faith. That you and I are saved, not by any works that we do, not by any characters that we have gained, but only by the great work of Christ on the cross and appropriated by us, to us, by our faith. The just shall live by faith. The other great truth that he preached was the new birth. When he went to Oxford, Charles Wesley gave him a book, The Life of God in the Soul. He was dealing with that subject, the new birth. Something new to Whitfield. And that was perhaps the major note in his preaching. He must be born again. His uh, favorite sermon on that subject is any man who is in Christ. He is a new preacher. And he made the doctrine of regeneration, the new birth, very reasonable. He said, what would a deaf man, how would he enjoy music? A blind man, how would he enjoy a beautiful landscape of painting? And what would an unregenerated man do if he got to heaven? Underlying this truth is stated by Jesus, you must be born again, is the whole foundation of the gospel. As the apostle put it, if Christ died for all, then I thus judge that all were dead. That's good logic and good truth. By nature, you and I are all dead spiritually, and only the Spirit of God can awaken us. He said Whitfield on this subject, showing the reasonableness of it, although it's a great mystery to just as a piece of gold dug out of the ore, when it is refined and polished, may be said to be a new piece, and just as a glass covered with mud and filth, when it has been wiped clean and polished, may be said to be a new glass, and just as Naaman, when he came up out of the Jordan, and his flesh came to him as a little child, might have been called a new man. So our souls, although the same in essence, when they are purged of the sin by the Holy Spirit, may be spoken of as new souls. Of all his sermons, the one that moved me most was the sermon on Peter. He divides it into three parts, the steps that led to Peter's fall, the fall of Peter and his recovery. And after that look of Jesus in the courtyard of Caiaphas, he describes the remark of Peter, Oh, where have I been on the devil's ground? What have I been doing? conversing with the devil's children. What have I done? I have denied the Lord of glory. With oaths and curses denied that I ever knew him. And now, where shall I go? And where can I hide my guilty faith? I have sinned against the life 
I have sinned against repeated tokens of his dear and distinguishing love. I have sinned against repeated warnings. I have sinned in the sunlight, in the face of the enemies of my master, and made them to blaspheme. How now can I hope ever to see his faith still less to be employed by that dear Christ again. O oh, Peter, Peter, thou art undone. Truly thou mayest be cast away like a broken vessel. God be merciful to me, a sinner. He was a great saint to James Hervey, the student whom he converted at Oxford when he was a student himself, and the author of the famous book, Meditations Among the Tombs, said that he never saw a fairer pattern of Jesus Christ. Whitfield belonged to the Calvinistic branch of that great evangelical movement as against the Wesley. And I spoke of that in a sermon on John Wesley. But their friendship was not finally broken. When Whitfield set out for America the last time, he asked what person he desired to preach his memorial sermon if he died in America. And he said, only one man, John Wesley. Well, when Whitfield died at Newbury Port, and the news reached England, a woman came up to Wesley after his sermon one Sabbath in his church, the Founders. She was an adherent of Whitfield, and knowing their difference on the subject of predestination, she said to him, Mr. Wesley, do you expect to see Whitfield in heaven? Mr. Whitfield in heaven? She thought a moment and said, no. Ah, she said, but she was looking for that sort of an answer. That's what I thought she would say. Wait a moment, she said. Madam, when I get to heaven, George Whitfield will be so near the throne that a sinner like me will never catch a glimpse of him. His seal and device showed wings outspread. And with the Latin word, Astro Titanus, we desire the stars. And there among the stars we need them. For they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the sun. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Let us go. We thank thee, O God that thou didst raise up this son of thunder, this mighty trumpet-like voice, declaring, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We pray earnestly for the spirit of Whitfield, that great hunter of souls in our pulpit and in our churches. And may those who occupy even the humblest place realize their precious opportunity to testify for Christ and to call some sinners unto repentance. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.